So um, go ahead and say more about authorship and your take on the identity of the beloved disciple. Sure. Well, uh, what's interesting is, um, I, m my personal view is, and th this is, I've become more and more confident of, of this over the 20 years since I wrote this commentary on John's wisdom. Um, the internal evidence, I mean, this is a scholarly principle. The internal evidence is primary. The external evidence has to be secondary. So what church fathers were saying about this gospel in the late first, in the second, third, and fourth century, that's one thing. The internal evidence is, is the primary way to figure out who in the heck wrote this. So there's no reference to the beloved disciple in the first 10 chapters of John. The phrase never occurs. Nobody is identified as the beloved disciple. But when you get to John 11, at the beginning of John 11, in the story about Lazarus being ill and needing to be healed, we hear these words messages sent to Jesus who's far away, the one whom you love is ill. And the very mm. next verse identifies this person as Lazarus. Now, if you're listening to this gospel and you get to that point, and then after John 11, the phrase, the beloved disciple crops up in 13, and in the uh, passion narrative itself, at the cross, at the tomb, at Caiaphas's house, etc. Well, the natural way to hear that and process that is this is a continuation of what was said in John 11. I mean, that's perfectly natural. Ancient people didn't have private copies of these Gospels. Christian communities were lucky to have some of the New Testament documents at all. We don't have a canon of the New Testament yet. Uh, only, I mean, Paul's letters were beginning to be collected at the end of the first century AD. And uh, so for me, um, the best case scenario is this is probably Lazarus, whose real name is Eliezer. We call him Lazarus because that's an anglicized form of the name. And, and I say that for a lot of reasons. First of all, I don't think the Gospel of John was written to correct some mistakes in the synoptics. The synoptics are pretty clear. None of the 12 were present at the crucifixion of Jesus. They had either denied, betrayed, or run away. Okay, mm. that's point number one. But John 19 front lights that the beloved disciple and his mother and several other women are present right at the cross. So close, they can hear Jesus talking and breathing and everything, okay? And what we are told is that Jesus says from the cross, and again, this is only in the Gospel of John, nothing like this in Matthew, Mark, and Luke. He says, son, behold your mother. And then he says, woman, behold your son. And then we are told and he, the beloved disciple, took Mary into his home thereafter. Well, where was that? Well, the answer is it's in Bethany. This is Lazarus's home. Mary didn't go all the way back to Galilee and, and spend time with fishermen. Why would she? She has other children. You know, she would have gone back to Nazareth and been with her other children for sure. And we find Mary in Acts 1.14 in the upper room with the other disciples praying. So it's clear she's still in Jerusalem while the passion, the resurrection, and the subsequent lead up to Pentecost happens 40 days later. So it seems really clear to me that the prima facie evidence, the internal evidence, points to a Judean disciple, and I would say Lazarus. Now, there are other clues. The famous story of Lazarus being raised from the dead, who was more than three days dead by, by Jesus, takes us to the story of the resurrection of Jesus in John 20. Peter and the beloved disciple run to the tomb. Peter walks into the tomb, says, huh, grave clothes, and leaves scratching his head. The beloved disciple looks into the tomb and sees grave clothes rolled up. And it says, and he believed 
even though he did not yet know from Scripture Jesus had to rise from the dead. Well, Hmm. guess what? This scene is eerily familiar. It had just happened to him not long before then. So, of course, he believes if I could rise from the dead, Jesus can rise from the dead. I mean, that just sort of clarifies that whole story as to what's going on in that story. Or consider the transition from John 12 to John 13 to back up a little bit. In John 12, we have a celebration of the fact that Lazarus is alive again in the house of Mary, Martha, and Lazarus in Bethany, right? And Jesus' feet is being anointed, and there's a discussion there, and good things are happening there. And then you turn the page to John 13. And by the way, the Greek at the beginning of John 13 says this happened early in the week of the Passover. So this is not a description of the Last Supper. It's an earlier supper in the week, and that's why we don't have this is my body, this is my blood, etc., 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 in this meal. What we have instead is foot washing, okay? But the crucial thing is, who is Jesus reclining with at that meal in John 13? And the answer is, he's re- reclining with a beloved disciple. Now, the normal way that those meals would run is the host reclines with the chief guest. If the host is Lazarus and Jesus is reclining at the table with, at, at the, on the couch with him for this meal, well, then the transition again from John 12 to John 13 is natural. Okay, here we have a meal in the house of Mary, Martha, and Lazarus, and Jesus is there with the disciples. Same thing in John 13, and it's made very clear that this is done um, because the beloved disciple is the host of what's going on there. So, I mean, it clarifies a lot of the more mysterious things that are going on. Or take the story, for example, of going to Caiaphas's house. Only in the Gospel of John, we hear not only Peter goes to Caiaphas' house, but also this beloved disciple. And he's let right into the house. Well, why? Because the high priest and his entourage already know Lazarus. Indeed, some of them were at his funeral, mourning him when Jesus came to raise him from the dead, and had seen that happen. They know Lazarus. They don't know a Galilean fisherman named Cephas from a hole in the wall. So, I mean, once you begin to read this second half of the Gospel of John, you part, put things together, they begin to make a lot better sense. And finally, the last big point would be in John 21. Now, Lazarus has been raised from the dead in a dramatic rising from the dead. And At the very end of John 21, Peter uh, says to Jesus, well, what about this man? Because Peter's just been told, in essence, he's going to be martyred. You're going to stretch out your hands, and you won't be free to go anywhere, and et cetera. And Peter asks Jesus, well, what about this other person, the beloved disciple? And Jesus says, if it is my will that he remain until I return, what's that to you? Come and follow me. But then the evangelist has to clarify. The evangelist puts in a parenthesis, Jesus did not say he would live until Jesus came back. He simply said, if it is my will. Now, why do you need that clarification? Because, because, No doubt, many people thought if he's already been raised from the dead, he's not going to die again. But he did. He did. What we have in this gospel is his memoirs put together by somebody else named John, who collected his written memoirs, edited them, and framed them into this beautiful gospel of John. So uh, most of the big conundrums that are raised by the second half of the gospel of John are, are answered, A, by saying this is written by a Judean disciple, and B, most probably it's written, uh, the memoir, the, the initial writing of this source material was by Lazarus, 
even though it's collected and edited and put together in the final form by somebody named John. Fascinating. So over the last several decades, have you found that more and more New Testament scholars are adopting that view? Well, here's the interesting thing. I presented this, uh, not quite like I just shared it with you, but, but in, a, in a scholarly paper, to a whole room, hundreds of Johannine scholars, expecting a whole bunch of pushback. There was no pushback. There was, mm. oh, <laughs> oh. Now, what they did want to know is, okay, now which John put this together? And that's when I pointed out that we now have papyrological evidence that John, son of Zebedee, was probably martyred early just like his brother was. I mean, James, son of Zebedee, was martyred by Herod Agrippa II. Right. And, and that's recorded in the book of Acts. And, of course, Jesus predicted that the two Zebedees would be baptized with the same baptism he was baptized with, and what he's talking about is his death. He's talking about martyrdom, you know, baptized in blood by death, by martyrdom. And uh, so uh, I suggested that it's not John, son of Zebedee, it's John of Patmos who put these documents together. And of course, we have clear evidence that he was connected to those communities in Ephesus and the other six churches, because he wrote to them as an authority figure for them. So I think it's John of Patmos who presented to us in the, in the 90s, the final form of this gospel, after he returned from exile when Domitian died in the early 90s. I think that this is the last gospel to be fully formed, but what he had done is he'd gone back and collected the memoirs of uh, the beloved disciple in, in Asia Minor and put together this, this beautiful document we call the Gospel of John. Okay, that's interesting. Yeah, that's, that's something to think about for sure. Because I was always used to the traditional view, but... Um. Sure. And let me tell you where that comes from. It largely comes from a certain reading of Justin Martyr and also from Irenaeus. But the earliest witness about who wrote this gospel is Papias from the end of the first century AD. And he distinguishes between two Johns. There's John the Apostle, whom he never met who was the earlier John. And there's John the Elder, the one he calls the Elder. That surely has to be John of Patmos, whom he did actually meet late in the first century AD. So uh, Papias says nothing about it must have been written by John, the son of Zebedee. He simply says this document was put together by John, by a John, and I met him. I met this person. Well, for my money, what that means is the source material in the Gospel of John and 1 John is material from the beloved disciple. But notice how 2 and 3 John are labeled. These, these are letters from the elder to churches that are remote from where he is. Okay? Well, I think John the Patmos is John the Elder. It, that, that, that makes perfectly good sense to me. And we know he was involved with those communities, uh, not only from the book of Revelation, but later we know that some John was buried right there in Ephesus. There's a, a church uh, with a baptismal font, an early church from about the fourth or fifth century that remembers St. John the Divine who gave us this gospel. Okay, fine. It's just not John Zebedee. All right. So how about the social setting of the gospel and particularly how the church in this situation is related to the synagogue? Yeah, that's an important thing. But one more thing needs to be said about this other matter. The real reason the church fathers in the fourth and fifth centuries said it must have been written by an apostle is because the Gnostics loved this gospel of John. Okay. They used, it was their main gospel in the second and third century. And Irenaeus was swatting Gnostics like flies. And he, he wanted to say, it can't be 
the way they understand it. Therefore, it must have been written by one of the 12. Therefore, it must have been written by one of the original apostles. Now, Irenaeus is making all kinds of assumptions, but what he's trying to do is rescue the Gospel of John from the grasp of the Gnostics so that the Orthodox Church wouldn't lose the Gospel of John. So that's how that whole tradition of it has to be by the son of Zebedee came from. It was the church saving orthodox documents from heresy. That's what right. was going on. Making it more authoritative, so yes, to speak. Yes, exactly. Exactly. Please check out more videos from The Charge. Don't forget to click on like and hit the subscribe button.